All right, I think we can get started. <clears throat> uh, people will join as we go, I'm sure. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Bruce Campbell. I'm the director of the Latino Latin American Studies program here at College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. Um, I've put my email contact information into the chat <clears throat> um, in case you're interested in uh, chatting with me at some point about the Latino Latin American Studies minor program or the learning community uh, that we organize every semester. Um, you might be interested to know about the uh, human rights themed mural that we have underway uh, currently or the one we're planning on uh, starting next semester, hopefully, um, on the theme of anti-racism. Um, I want to welcome you all to the second event in our fall Latino Latin American Studies series, uh, exploring the theme of race, gender, and power in Latin America. Um, Latin America's, <clears throat> excuse me, Latin America's racial and gender systems are different, as many of you may know, both historically and the, in the present from those of the United States. For example, the territories that are now called the United States were colonized through the physical displacement and from the land and isolation of native peoples, while what is now called Latin America was colonized by subjugating native peoples as a cheap labor source for the colonial economy. Where the United States is characterized by a history of white supremacism expressed and embodied through a binary racial system, white versus non-white, Latin America's history of racism is marked by the complication of mestizaje, which is a Spanish term for racial and cultural mixing, and a complex hierarchy of racial dominance reflected in the colonial era casta system. Latin America's gender binary, male, female, masculine, feminine, is different from that of the United States in part due to the majoritarian cultural power of Catholicism, which has shaped a regional cultural ideal of femininity in the image of the Virgin Mary. At the same time, women have been elected to the national presidency in Central and South America, but not in North America. Um, this semester's event series highlights some of the different ways and different contexts in Latin America in which gender and racial identity are negotiated. Tonight, Dr. Dos Santos will help us focus on the Brazilian context. Uh, Dr. Pedro Dos Santos is an associate professor of political science at uh, CSBSJU, colleague of mine in the Latino Latin American Studies program, and teaches comparative politics and international relations. His research focuses on the intersection of gender and politics in Brazil and Latin America. In addition to numerous articles and book chapters, he has co-authored a book to be released in February of 2021 titled Women's Empowerment and Disempowerment in Brazil, The Rise and Fall of President Dilma Rousseff. I will now turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Du Santos, who will explain tonight's format. Thank you. And I hope you're all clapping right now at home for me. I uh, hope to hear that uh, uh, from, th from the echoes. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, and I'm going to try something different today. Uh, I pre-recorded this, this talk. And I want to use the, the Zoom chat. Uh, I'm going to be sharing some links as well as, I, as the talk goes on. Uh, if you're interested in, in that and uh, some of the issues that are going on and also feel free to ask questions on the chat as well. So, and I'll reply those to those questions as I go because I'll be here watching as well. Uh, and if it's, there's something that I think you'll be better to answer after the, the, the presentation is over to give more context, I will do that. But I really encourage you all to, uh, you know, use the Zoom chat option to, uh, to ask questions as well. Uh, as, as, as we're going, even if it's clarification questions about something that you're confused because, you know, it's Brazil and Brazil is not for beginners. Um, so, uh, so I'll go ahead and start now. I'll, I'll share the, the, the video here uh, and we'll um, keep talking, hopefully. Uh, this talk is based on a book written by me and Dr. Farida Jalalzai of Virginia Tech University. The book uh, will be published by Temple University Press and it's coming out in the spring of 2021. Okay, so here's a quick outline of uh, where, where I'm going with this conversation today. First, I'm gonna do a brief theoretical grounding of uh, women's representation and empowerment uh, to frame how uh, we're gonna think about Jim Husef's presidency in this talk today. Then I'm gonna give you a really quick profile of former President Husef from her her years as a, a guerrilla fighter in Brazil uh, uh, to the, her presidency. Uh, 
uh, I will give you a quick timeline as well of um, her her presidencies as well up to the impeachment process and I'll talk a little bit about the impeachment process and some of the gendered ways uh, that played out then I will spend some time talking to you about her um, role in appointing women to cabinet positions to ministerial positions in Brazil and the kind of the dynamics of that uh, and then I will talk a little bit about her policy making initiatives how she tried to empower women how she succeeded how she didn't succeed and some of the uh, long-term implications of her administration her presidency in that uh, and then I'll end uh, with some general conclusions about um, this whole thing I'm not going to spend much time on this because this is just boring theory over here but if you want to know more about it please ask a question uh, at the end of the, of, the, of the talk or in the Q&A or in the chat right now the literature on women's representation has grown considerably in the past decades following the rise of women in parliamentary positions around the world a lot of work is based on Hannah Pitkin's groundbreaking discussion on representation where she argues that representation is dynamic and falls into the four categories outlined in this slide research on women presidents and prime ministers is more recent mainly for the fact that there are so few women executives in the world that number has increased in the past decades and at one point in the 2000s Latin America saw four women presidents at the same time but the number of women executives is very low compared to men with most countries having never elected a woman president to their chief executive position as you can see from this Pew Research uh, from 2017 uh, Pew Research Center uh, uh, graph uh, 77 countries that they they have the numbers have never had a woman president in very few countries uh, in president or prime minister right so in, in an executive position and very few countries have had women in power for more than 15 years therefore research on women executives must account for dynamics present specifically in these positions we rely on the work of Amy Alexander Catherine Bozendal and Farida de Lauzai to frame the actions of Brazil's president in terms of women's empowerment or the enhancement of access assets capabilities and achievements of women to gain equality to men influencing and exercising political authority worldwide and again we can talk more about this uh, uh, kind of deconstruct this and we will kind of focus I will focus on this a little bit in like specific contexts throughout the talk um, you know and we are especially interested in how a woman president in a country where uh, the president exerts considerable power like Brazil uses the position to empower other women doing her tenure in office Juma Rousseff's rise to the presidency was not a common path neither for women presidents in other countries nor for former presidents in Brazil her 2010 campaign was the first time she ever ran for office even though she spent most of her life directly involved in politics one thing is almost constant throughout her biography her presence in masculine spaces raised in a middle-class family Juma Rousseff entered high school in 19, 1964 the year the military realized a coup a coup d'etat and established a military dictatorship that lasted for two decades Rousseff soon joined the student movement and quickly became involved in the clandestine anti-government militia organizations she became a leader within her groups holding her own against men in a movement that was overwhelmingly masculine and male dominated she was arrested in 1970 and spent three years in jail being the, uh, the victim of tor torture and physical abuse that left long lasting scars after leaving prison Hussef moved and started pursuing a degree in economics another male dominated space in the early 1980s she helped found the Democratic Workers Party or PDT and started raising started to raise through the ranks in various appointed positions she eventually switched to the workers party the PT and in 2003 as state secretary of mines and energy became well known for succeeding in pro protecting the, her state from a nationwide energy crisis this caught the attention of newly elected president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva who decided to appoint her as minister of mines and energy a prestigious position previously only held by men Lula eventually appointed her to be the administration chiefs administration's chief of staff the second most powerful position behind the president in Brazil 
It was at this point that pundits started seeing Rousseff as a possible choice to succeed Lula as president. Understanding the symbolism of being the first working class president, Lula saw in Rousseff an, a possible extension of his legacy, bringing the first woman president. Um, I am, of course, skipping many inter interesting political points here, and will gladly expand on it during Q&A, but two things are clear. Rousseff rose to the ranks as a competent bureaucrat, not a politician, well, a politician, and she was accustomed to being the only woman in the room, accustomed to navigate masculine spaces. So what happened for a president, regardless of their gender, to enjoy a long, a long honeymoon period of high approval ratings to eventually being forced, forcibly removed from office? Here, I want to make clear that both from an academic and personal perspective, I do not see Hussein's presidency or the PT 16 years in power as a left-wing utopia. There were serious issues that dated back to Lula's presidency, including various corruption scandals. Hussein surely made mistakes during her administration too, especially on how she dealt with the economy. Other issues were structural exogenous, um, structural and exogenous, meaning that while Brazil fared well in 08 when most of the world's economies were melting down, some of the economic policies of Lula and Rousseff only postponed the inevitable crisis. That, you know, and that crisis that came out of vengeance in 2015. But I also make, I want to make it clear that the impeachment was, like all impeachments, a political move. One to remove her from office, not for the transgressions uh, uh, Congress charged her with, but because elites had decided that they could not wait three more years for, a prefer, for their preferred president. president. Uh, and I also want to make it clear that, uh, as I'm going to show later on, um, that were other issues with uh, Juma's government, but specifically um, w in regards to women's empowerment and women's representation, um, that was a major shift, uh, and, and, and for mo by most accounts, a negative shift in from the end of Rousseff's administration to what we have today. And I'll talk more about this in a little bit. Um, so, you know, between 2008 and 2013, Brazil experienced unexpected economic growth, which led to a fairly stable first three years for the Rousseff government. Then, in 2013, as the economy starts showing signs of slowing down, a protest in the city of Sao Paulo against a local bus fare increase morphed into one of the biggest protests in Brazil since the return to democracy. Millions of people went to the streets to protest many things, including Dilma Rousseff. No one realized at the time but this would eventually shift into a large organized protest directly against the president. In 2014, Rousseff won the most contested and closest presidential election since the return to democracy in the 1980s. Her political opponents vowed to de legitimize her second term even before it began. Um, 20, 20, 2015 started with a full-blown economic crisis, and you can see here the GDP growth for 2014 and 2015, the major dip that happened, and you, know, and you can see also how one, presidential approval in Brazil, like most countries, tend to be tied with the economy, but two, especially how in, in Juma's term, there was a dip before, but a dip was much more prevalent uh, in 2015 and 2016 because of both the economic crisis and uh, these corruption scandals that I'm going to talk about in a second here. So, you know, there was a crisis that was made worse after Operation Car Wash unveiled one of the biggest government corruption schemes in the history of the world. From that moment on, her government was on survival mode. But in 2016, there was enough support in Congress for her impeachment, and in April, she was removed from office by the lower house. In August, the Senate voted to permanently remove her from office, two years before the end of her term. Uh, as most things here, the story is fascinating and complicated. Uh, there were a lot of issues also between Rousseff and uh, the Speaker of the House in Brazil. Uh, and that was actually one of the reasons that uh, Rousseff was impeached is because it was, uh, in a way, retaliation for uh, the Workers' Party, Rousseff's party, allowing uh, an impeachment process to start against the Speaker of the House, right? So the Speaker of the House in Brazil that started the impeachment process for Juma was eventually impeached from his, his uh, post and was arrested for corruption. Uh, and that's another thing that's important to remember too, with all the corruption that happened surrounding Juma Hussef and surrounding the Workers' Party, you know, including the arrest of Lula later on, um, Juma Hussef herself was never directly connected to any of those corruption scandals, right? So, so in corruption is definitely a part of it, the economy is a part of it, but these are moving parts that kind of all together are interesting kind of uh, dynamics 
of uh, Brazilian politics at the time. And again, I can ex expand on this if, you have, if people have questions about this specifically, or if you know something you want to know more about it, uh, we can talk about this in the Q&A as well. Rousseff's impeachment was the second since Brazil returned to democracy, electing presidents in 1989. The first impeachment in 1992 ousted Fernando Collor de Mello over corruption allegations and kickback schemes. Collor chose to resign prior to the Senate vote in an attempt to preserve his political rights. In both impeachments, structural and institutional reasons can help explain the outcome. One of the more widely accepted explanations to why these two presidents were impeached and not others also involved in corruption allegations, comes from the coalition presidentialism literature. Both presiden presidents governed with a small and fickle coalition in Congress because their party did not have a majority of seats, which in a moment of crisis turned against them. That two presidents have been impeached in the last 30 years are both good news and bad news for Brazilian democracy. The good news is that even as the country becomes embroiled in not one, but two institutional crises, the democratic institutions of the country continue to operate. The bad news is that using this nuclear option twice, that the democratic institutions of the country are not as strong as hoped. The use of such a forceful maneuver to ouster President Rousseff was dubbed a par parliamentary coup by her supporters. The debate of whether it was a coup or a legitimate impeachment still rages in Brazil, with the two camps extremely polarized both using legal and ideological arguments to justify what happened. The coup narrative, by the way, was came directly from Rousseff's camp and from Rousseff herself and became a rallying cry against her impeachment. Non vai ter golpe, there'll be no coup, as the picture there below uh, shows, uh, became the rallying cry of the left and of Rousseff's support, supporters. What happened, what happened was best summed by a reporter I, I interviewed in 2017. The impeachment was a convenient way out, of a country, for, out for a country that reached a consensus that things could not continue as they were. New information that surfaced in the, in the last two years point more towards an extra legal coup-like dynamic than an orderly institutional pro process. I can elaborate more about this on the Q&A, uh, and I'll be glad to do so, but I want to kind of focus on this because I want to focus on a specific aspect of the coup now. Uh, the impeachment process by itself may, may be seen as gender neutral, and the fact that one man and one woman have been impeached in Brazil may corroborate this argument. But the vitriol, vitriol experienced by Rousseff throughout the process was something that went, in many ways, above and beyond the expected ruthlessness in a contested political event. So, while the institutional process follows set procedures, gender matters when a woman like Rousseff is being forcibly removed from office. To think about the process, we focus on philosopher Kate Mann's groundbreaking work on misogyny and the scholarship on violence against women in politics developed by Mona Crook and Juliana Sani. Mann defines misogyny as a system that places, places, punishes, dominates, and condemns women who are perceived as an enemy or a threat to the patriarchy. It, if thinking of the patriarchy as institutions that reinforce male dominance in the system, there is no bigger transgression than being the first woman elected to the most powerful position of the country. In various interviews we heard about men, especially congressmen, who were filled with rage towards Rousseff for the simple fact that she would interrupt him, would yell at them, would disagree with them. In a conservative society like Brazil, a divorced woman entering the presidency could also be perceived as a transgression from what is expected from women. Misogyny can lead to vicious attacks, and the literature on violence against women in politics have tried to address this issue. In our book, we discuss in depth three types of violence experienced by Rousseff, framing this in the context of misogyny, of putting women in their place. So we talk about uh, the symbolic violence of constantly questioning her fit for office based on fabricated or exaggerated questions about her intellect the psychological violence of using a clearly gender term, a term of endearment in some contexts, you know, goodbye dear, ciao querida, as seen in the picture up there too, with all mostly male congressmen using ciao querida as the rallying cry, as their catchphrase actually, for, uh, for the impeachment process. And then finally, sexual violence that was created for the, uh, in the creation and distribution of a car decal 
depicting a rape of Husef as a protest for high gas prices. I can elaborate on all, any of these later on in the Q&A, um, but because these are long stories and complicated stories, and sometimes they're triggering stories too, I'll keep it to this uh, aspect right now, uh, just for now, right? Um, so, you know, in, in, in some, for the impeachment process specifically, um, as we have seen here in the United States, the impeachment, impeachments are political theater, right? It's not about being right or being wrong, but it's about dominating the narrative, right? The anti-Rusaf narrative in Brazil was gendered in ways that was almost impossible to escape misogyny, to escape the unnecessary violent and vitriolic language used against Rousseff because she was a woman, because she is a woman, and using her womanhood as a tool for punishment, an attempt to put her in her place. Okay, so now I'm getting to the tail end. I think the last third of the talk here, uh, we'll be talking about this, that the ways in which Husef attempted, succeeded, and did not succeed in em empowering women uh, through um, through appointments, through policy making, and symbolically. And even though I'll be talking about Juma Husef, uh, a couple of things to think in my, uh, keep in mind is that I will be in many moments comparing her to her predecessors, but especially Lula. For, for because he was from the same party as she was, uh, and then I'll provide some, uh, you know, some of what's going on right now, but especially focusing on uh, Michel Temer's government in 2016 to 2018, and then uh, Jair Bolsonaro's government uh, from 2019 and to uh, present. So I guess one thing is just kind of think about this, like four distinct periods. Uh, we have the Lula years and also some moments before the Lula years, but the Lula years were characterized by the first time the Workers' Party, this left-wing party, had um, access to um, uh, leadership and access to the presidency and also, you know, a, a strong but not a majority in Congress. Um, then we have this long honeymoon period. Juma gets elected in 20, 2010, takes office in 2011, and um, experiences really good um, economic indicators, as I mentioned before. So that's the long honeymoon period, is 2011 to 2013. And then we have the crisis years, 2014 to 2016. Um, then when she gets impeached, we have, you know, uh, uh, Temer and Bolsonaro. So keep those in mind as I'm talking, um, you know, and think about these two also, if you're asking, you want to ask some questions, uh, understand, like, even though Juma is in power for six years, there is two very distinct moments in her, her presidency. You know, the moment where she's doing okay, you know, and people are liking her, and she has actually report uh, in Congress. And then we have this crisis years where she's basically just trying to stay in power uh, and it coming into her not not being able to stay in power. So just keep those things in mind as we keep going for the last third of this conversation. So to start our, our conversation about appointing women and how we, uh, Juma Hussef tried to empower women through appointments, uh, I want to show two pictures. First, this is uh, Juma Hussef's 2011 um, first ministers. So just take a look at the picture, right? And then here, this is not a picture of, of uh, Tamir's ministers when he took power in 2016, but this is pretty much it, right? So it's a bunch of older, middle-aged to older men, uh, more specifically, also in the context of Brazil, uh, white men. So I want to start with these. So again, thinking about this again, like comparing Juma to other presidents, this is the immediately following her, we see uh, a very strong dip in the number of women appointed to positions of power uh, in the executive specifically. So how is appointing women a way of empowering women? So um, what we argue is that this is a direct form of empowerment and it has implications for elite women who are in the political process and who are in the party of the president specifically, but also has implications down the line for women broadly because it does have policy implications. So. Um, so specifically, you know, empowers women already in the elite. So these women are being tapped to become ministers uh, in, in, in places and in ways that they have not been appointed before. So it opens up this room for uh, more women in politics and more women in leadership positions. 
Um, and in the context of Brazil, ministers have great discretion over policy priorities. So uh, ministries in Brazil work directly with Congress in terms of uh, producing uh, uh, law projects. Uh, and also budgetarily speaking, they have a lot of say as well in terms of how uh, laws that pass in Congress are allocated through through the budget as well. They have the discretion of how to use the budget that is allocated to specific ministries, right? Um, and then, you know, in, in, in this context here, you know, the president's own network. So, you know, being a woman president may be an explanation to have some of this appointed decision. So she may be empowering women directly related to her, you know, in this political sense, in this ideological sense, in the professional sense. Right. So these are some ways that these are this is uh, that Juma is um, directly uh, empowering women through the appointment to ministry positions. Some of the insights from our from our from our research and I'm going to keep it simple here uh, and I can definitely elaborate on this um, on the more complex dynamics in uh, the Q&A. Um, so some of the insights, you know, one thing is that Husef appointed more women than all previous elected presidents combined. Right. And, and a lot of these positions were in positions close to the president, meaning prestigious, prestigious positions. But, you know, so because Brazil has so many ministries, some of those are very tangential, very kind of uh, on the margins. These are women who were in Juma's inner circle. Right. Uh, so that again, anyway, show again this idea that the president's own networks may be one of the explanations for this decision. And also here's just a table to show you, uh, uh, you know, so José Sarné, who was not directly elected, but he was a president, uh, um, was a civilian president, uh, appointed zero women to uh, to ministries. Collor appointed two, Franco appointed one, Cardoso appointed two, and then Lula, from the same party as Juma, so coming from the same kind of like ideas and from the same, in a way, pool of possible appointed uh, 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 ministers appointed 14 total in his, in his eight years in power, and Juma appointed total 36, uh, sorry, 23 women, 16.67 percent of the women. Right. So something that is uh, important to note too is that uh, Juma, when she was elected, she did uh, promise, uh, especially the women's movement, that she would appoint 30 percent of women to power. And uh, um, she was never, she got to 24% at one point, you know, at, at one specific moment, but she never break the 30% mark. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go into the details of this specifically, but you know, the crisis definitely affected that, her ability to nominate more women, but also the dynamics of coalition presidentialism. You know, Juma was not responsible for all the appointments, and she had relied on the other parties to appoint uh, the women. That was actually, uh, you know, with uh, Tamer in that picture that I showed, uh, when people started complaining to him, there was a bunch of white dudes. He uh, made a complaint that this was actually part of uh, the other parties in his coalition. They made the decision, so he had no discretion over it, and they just didn't appoint any women. So he just passed the buck to the parties, right? And so something that is interesting here, both Lula, who appointed more women than most uh, men before him, and then Juma, who appointed the most women, uh, um, uh, to uh, minister, ministerial positions, um, all these positions come from their quota, from their, you know, from from the people that they in personally nominate through their party uh, um, uh, quota for uh, ministers. So again, um, in the context of our research, uh, we looked at uh, how Juma Hussef uh, empowered elite women specifically, but with 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 longer reverberations, like another interesting factor. Uh, they haven't been able to kind of dig deep into the, into the data yet, but, um, you know, it seems to to be that when women get appointed to ministries, uh, that is a spillover effect, a cascading effect almost, a trickle down effect uh, of more women in lower positions that are also important, that, that tend to be springboard for other positions, for Congress positions, and, you know, for Congress elections, and also for for being appointed ministers later, so there was a cascading effect of women being elected, uh, be, sorry, being uh, more, uh, be members of the cabinet cabinet staff uh, in ways that were not there before. Again, this is, uh, at this point, it's anecdotal, anecdotal in the sense that I, we haven't run, like, specific 
data on this. We've just seen we've seen the data. We haven't been able to code it directly to see, but uh, but there, there seems to be a clear connection there that, that there are more women when women are in power as well in other positions. I want to read this quote from our book uh, to provide a little context of the the ways that gender play a factor that sometimes we collectively don't think much about, right? But how important gender is. Um, in terms of how politics are done, and and what adding women to the to the mix when a when a, in a place that was heavily masculine before, what what that does to politics and what it does to the to dynamics, right? So this is a quote from a high level operator, like a high level uh, politician bureaucrat appointed to positions both at during Lula's administration and during Juma's administration. So he said. Ministers who are good at political articulation, before Lula probably as well, but I cannot speak about that because I was not there, must attend events in this masculine and masculinized spaces, spaces of fraternization among deputies late at night. Lula would never go into the spaces, but he would hug the guys in his masculine logic, um, and it was a different hug. Puja cara, shit man, you get it. The masculine contact, the male intimacy, intimacy. Juma comes from a different tradition. She didn't have command of male slang, of the Jiria masculina. Her minister for political articulation was a woman, a married woman, a respectable woman. She went to some night meetings, but the night was not her strong suit. Why am I saying all this? Because Lula was a political animal. He could have a Juma at the helm when, he was, when, when he, she was his chief of staff, a more technical minister. Juma was not this political animal. She needed to have these political animals under her, and she didn't have them. So, again, this this um, this masculine spaces um, that he mentions, um, something that uh, I've talked to other people about, this is not in our book, but something that I've talked to other people about is that these, um, there are some very questionable places where these decisions are being made, right? So, um, these are places where this is somebody's house, for example, you know, in Brasilia, in Brazil, there are these mansions that people go in, and they have this, uh, you know, large parties uh, with a lot of alcohol and a lot of women, not there for political articulation and political negotiation, right? Um, and those are just spaces that women don't feel comfortable. And of course, some men do not feel comfortable either, but they can still be there. So you know, in a way that they could be in these places, they may not be doing all the things that other men are doing in these spaces, but they're still there. In those spaces as well. Um, so, so yeah, this is just an interesting quote I think um, that really talks about this, the gender nature of po politics in Brazil, some of the limitations that Juma had because she was a woman to a certain extent, and because she, she, she aligned herself and she found other women who were good bureaucrats, good technical workers, good workers, but they were not quote unquote political animals, right? Uh, and that is, uh, you know, that, to me that's frustrating, but also the reality, uh, and, um, and that's something that's interesting too, as we have more women ministers and more more women in po position of power to start questioning some of these ways of doing politics. Now we move to policy making. And I, I, I'm gonna start this from after Juma to a certain extent. Um, in our interviews, especially in 2017 and 2018, uh, it was pretty clear that the women in the women's movement and women involved in politics who have been fighting for women's rights, broadly speaking, and I'm going to talk more about this, the, the, the differences in a second, but the women involved in women's rights, uh, it was almost unanimous that they all felt that uh, after Hussef's presidency was over, during the Temer years, um, they lost all contact with the government, you know, and now with Bolsonaro's new kind of conservative movement um, and, you know, a, a ministry for women's rights who is uh, uh, deeply religious and deeply conservative, that the rights that women were fighting for, for you know, in this liberal feminist perspective to a certain extent, uh, in a more progressive feminist perspective, um, that they lost everything. So if this is a quote from our book. You know, uh, this this activist in Goiânia, which is in the center-west of Brazil, we lost everything. We have to organize to keep fighting. 
um, uh, a, a career bureaucrat and, and, and the women's secretary in, in Brasilia. Uh, the moment we're going through, it is hard to think of victories. We, we lost almost everything. Um, uh, a former, uh, an activist and former minister of justice working in Brasilia. We lost so much, it's hard to think of any gains. Uh, and then Oliva Santana, who is now a mayor, mayoral candidate in the city of Salvador, uh, we lost everything that we conquered in the virtuous cycle of public policies targeting women. So I want to start from the end. Uh, and this to me was the most difficult chapter to a certain extent to write and also the most um, uh, uncertain uh, when I was writing. I wasn't sure where this was going to go. Uh, and, um, and especially in the context of when we started kind of thinking about this, this book, writing in 2014, it was a completely different reality from what came out in 2018. Um, but it, it is not a happy ending at all for women's rights, broadly speaking, in Brazil, um, and specifically for progressive women's rights, for feminist women's rights uh, that, are, um, um, uh, that were fought for since the 1980s, uh, especially. Um, so um, thinking about presence and power, so kind of some of the insights from this chapter, from these ideas that we're thinking about here. Um, you know, the Brazilian presidents, Brazilian presidents hold a significant policy authority, and that's what we were uh, thinking about in the context of Juma Rousseff empowering women through policymaking by creating policy priority and uh, emphasizing aspects of, of women's rights um, that she thought was were interesting and important. Um, so the policy making, I mentioned this on the previous slide, uh, policy making often begins in the executive. So there's an executive legislative relation there that's a little different from uh, other countries. So that gives the president some, again, some authority and some priority even on what needs to be done, right? Um, you know, so some of the insights, uh, most of the policies that, that were gendered in nature were a continuation of Lula's policies. But one thing that's important to note is that Hussef did uh, put a gender twist, even in policies that Lula had that were gender, quote unquote, gender neutral. She put a twist on them to make them, uh, to make it explicit in the leg in like how the, the policy was carried through to, to, to the bureaucracy to make it clear that this, this is supposed to target women and to benefit women especially. Right. Uh, and then there was some attempts from Juma at carving her own legacy in terms of women related policy. She was not successful in uh, most of them. But again, going back to this quote, uh, it's not necessarily if it was in a different context, that might have been a different analysis, a more critical analysis even of Juma's policies. But one thing was clear is that when her government ended, uh, the women's movements in Brazil lost complete control and even contact with the presidency. Um, you know, Juma Hussef and the women's movement never really saw eye to eye. One thing, Juma was not necessarily, you know, as I mentioned really early on her her profile, she didn't rise to uh, politics with a feminist agenda. She actually was a technical uh, uh, bureaucrat in very masculine spaces. So she didn't really get socialized in feminism actually ever. You know, she had friends, of course, but she wasn't really ever socializing feminism. So she actually bumped heads a lot with feminist activists and feminists in the government. Um, and that's some, also some interesting to kind of think about in this context as well. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the policies that she, uh, uh, that we kind of, that we looked in our book uh, and give a little bit of context of that. But I want to, I don't want to spend too much time on it because I want to spend some time uh, uh, with a Q&A for all of us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the theoretical framing of how we think about women's policies in Brazil. Actually, this is a part of a, a, a bigger literature uh, in um, uh, political science. Uh, then, then I'll give you a brief snippets of each of the policies that we analyze in our book. Um, and then I, I want to keep it open, you know, I try, try to keep it brief to keep it open for some discussions uh, for our Q&A. So, um, you know, when thinking about women's rights is a, is a complicated issue because, you know, women are, are, there are many women, many kinds of women. So think about women, we have to think about women intersectionally, right? Uh, so Toon and Weldon came with this typology to, to divide things into status-based, class-based, uh, 
uh, and then doctrinal and non-doctrinal, right? So again, status is about women as a whole. Class-based uh, is when there are differences in class dynamics on how um, uh, on, on how that policies would would affect women. Uh, non and doctrinal and non-doctrinal means like the general culture or the general traditions that exist. You know, a lot of times codified through through the religion uh, um, and how those you know policies that don't necessarily affect uh, don't go directly against doctrinal traditional values uh, and then doctrinal policies are the ones that are um, uh, that go against traditional values so again the good example here you know abortion law uh, uh, and reproductive freedom law those are doctrinal and status because it affects all women at the same level right and they are targeting um, specific uh, uh, and, and, you know, and is it specifically uh, um, something that uh, it is, goes against some traditional values that, that it may be in society. Now, public funding for abortion and contraceptives is still about that, still doctrinal, but it ad addressed the class issue because these women are, um, you know, public funding provides uh, more equ equitable access to women regardless of their status. So this is just kind of to get you thinking, so I'm going to actually bring in now some of the cases that we talked about in, in Brazil. So these are the uh, cases that we identified through our research and through interviews, and we focus on the four in um, um, in bold here, right? So again, thinking about this pre-Lula, Juma, and then post-Juma, uh, the Secretary of Women's Policies would look at the establishment of this ministry as a policy, right? That was a, a, trying to address gender issues, broadly speaking. Uh, and what we found is that, uh, you know, Lula started this, this, this Secretary of Women's Policies, um, Juma extended that and gave more funding to it until she actually eventually uh, um, abolished the, 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 the ministry for, you know, because of the crisis. Uh, but this was completely derailed after she left, uh, uh, after she was impeached, uh, and the, the SPM completely was completely kind of, um, not destroyed, but it was completely um, relegated to very subaltern positions inside other ministries, right? Um, the House of the Brazilian Woman, Casa da Mulher Brasileira, was the most interesting one. It addressed domestic violence, uh, and this was um, Juma's pet project, uh, and it was very costly, very inefficient too. It was a very questionable policy, and a lot of women in the human rights and violence against women uh, activism were against this. Uh, this the, her uh, her approach to this, uh, she carried it through as much as she could. But um, as her administration ended, these houses basically were not made. These were supposed to be like large buildings where centralized all the services provide that, that women who suffered domestic violence could use that way. So again, I can talk more about this in the Q&A uh, if people are interested in. Um, then we have uh, Bolsa Familia and Brazil Canioso, which are social assistance things that were there under Lula, so Juma was a con was a continuation of Lula's policies, but she made a very clear point that this was a gender thing that was for women. It was much more of a symbolic uh, thing than anything else, much more a symbolic uh, approach to thinking about this than actually uh, uh, you know a substantive change in the policy. But she really made a, made a point that this is for women, and I'm going to keep doing this for women. And then we have Hege Segonia, the Stork Network, uh, which is about maternal health, which is addressing specifically issues that happen uh, through the, the public uh, health system in Brazil, and that normally affects especially poor women. This was very interesting. Those, to me, was the most, most interesting things, because most women that I interviewed who are, in the majority, well, you know, middle class uh, women in urban areas, heavily criticized uh, the Stork Network, meaning that it was essentializing women, it was reverting back to old uh, stereotypes about women, using looking at women as vessels, you know, for for giving birth and not giving women autonomy, right? So again, kind of relating a little bit to abortion, uh, reproductive rights in general, right? But what's interesting to me is that the few women that we talked to that were from uh, peripheral areas uh, very much liked this policy, uh, and were very much um, thanked, thanked Duma specifically for this policies. Um, and, um, you know, so that was an interesting dynamic too. So, and like, again, like most of these things, the funding went literally from 300 million highs, equivalent to about $100 million, to zero 
as 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 Juma gets out of office. So again, I can talk more about these later on, but the the, the kind of the, the gist of it is this: like Juma tried some things, didn't succeed in some. Um, she ended up actually uh, bumping heads with the women's movements because they disagree in some of the ideas of what she saw as women's policies, right? Uh, but you know, and sometimes the Juma was actually successful in some ways, but also. Um, uh, um, even when she was successful, she was somewhat criticized by the women's movements themselves. So again, I can spend more time on this. I want to give you all some time to to do the Q and A as well. So I'll just say a couple words here uh, and then uh, open up for a discussion. Um, so you know, Jim Hussein's presidency was very controversial uh, from the beginning to the end, uh, uh, arguably both inside the Workers' Party itself, even by the choice, uh, led by her choice as the presidential candidate, uh, until the end and her impeachment, and until today, because it's still being highly debated in Brazil. Um, you know, from our research, a couple of things are clear. Well, one thing is actually, and I, I, a lot of people ask me this question, and I don't have a good answer. Um, you know, is Juma a feminist, or does, he cons does she consider herself a feminist? I've never seen her say I'm a feminist, um, but she clearly has um, understandings of what um, her role has been in terms of empowering women. Again, I didn't talk about the symbolic empowerment of women more in more detail here, but there's a symbolism to having a woman president, and she understood that symbolism and the power that symbolism has. So. She may not be a feminist in the sense that she um, talks about gender in those ways, and she sometimes, a lot of times, actually um, downplays uh, feminist ideas and feminist like um, feminist jargons, even. And I've seen, I've, I've heard and seen her do that. Um, but she understands. She has, she, she has her own understanding of, of what what gender means to her. And what gender means, and, and women's empowerment means, more broadly speaking, right? Um, so to label her a feminist, or to think of her as a self-labeled feminist, that's like actually a complicated question um, that I'm not sure I'm able to answer f fully. But she did try to empower women in her own understanding of what empowering women is. And that actually put her at odds sometimes with the women's movements, right? Um, but in the end, that's the, I think that's the biggest uh, takeaway from our book uh, that was um, not necessarily surprising, but still kind of, um, uh, in a way, heartbreaking is that uh, the women's movements that have been fighting for rights since the 1980s have lost almost everything, right? Both in terms of represent representational empowerment and substantive empowerment through policy making. Um, between my co-author and I, we had at least six women who cried during the interviews that were that we were doing, uh, because just thinking about those things made them very anxious about the future, very scared about the future uh, of women in politics in Brazil, and you know, and we, again with with direct life and death implications for women, uh, uh, specifically women of color and poor women in general. So it's a complicated legacy. It's a early. It's also early to address some of the longer term legacies of having Juma as a woman president. Um, it seems that actually that there has been an interesting effect because we have more conservative women running for office and winning positions of office than, than we had before in the country. So that might have been like a, a interesting kind of effect of bringing women from conservative sides to the conversation in a way to reject ideas of sexism and misogyny from from the conservative side in Brazil. Uh, so that's kind of interesting too. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it here, uh, you know, so uh, the very complicated history of empower, you know, kind of legacy of empowerment for, for Juma Rousseff. Uh, some interesting discussions here. I want to leave it open now for uh, so we can have some discussions. Thank you. All right, so uh, thank you for uh, the questions on the chat, but I'll, and also this question in the Q&A. Uh, so, and I think now what I'll do, I'll, I'll go back and forth. So if you, you can either ask questions on, um, um, on, on the chat or on the, on the Q&A and I'll just go back and forth. I think that that should work okay. Uh, so I, I will start with the first with a question on the Q and A. Uh, 
the question is, could you please talk about the treatment of women in Brazil more generally? Is there a difference on how women are viewed in Brazil versus the United States? Um, so, and there is, um, so there's a few ways of thinking about this, right? And again, thinking about it, women's empowerment, um, thinking about this in the context of elites, you know, women in politics, for example, so people who are going into politics, but, but also women in general, right? So um, the one thing that I can say is that Brazil is one of the worst, uh, has one of the highest rates of femicide in the world. So violence against women is a uh, part of Brazilian culture to a certain extent, but still, unfortunately, um, you know, we have actually in, 20, in 2006, uh, that was one of the policies that I mentioned in brief here, um, there was uh, a Lei Maria da Penha, the Maria da Penha law that was uh, passed that it, it is, it is lauded by most people as one of the most comprehensive um, violence against women laws in the country, uh, in the world. Um, and it was passed with the support from international organizations and all that. But, you know, one thing is passing a law and the other thing is implementing and giving budgetary you know, money for it. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll see this during the workers' party, there was some attempt for this. And as I mentioned uh, uh, in my talk, since then, there was a complete uh, decimation of, uh, of the funding for this. And violence against women has, uh, uh, has increased since 2016. At levels, at levels that are worrying to people who are uh, involved in, uh, you know, human rights issues and, and all that. So, so for, on a very broad level, um, women um, um, and the women have a, a very complicated place. Still, you know, they're still very patriarchal. Like machismo is still a thing that is very much ingrained in a Brazilian society. Uh, the public versus private space, meaning that you know, in the private space, the man is still. Uh, 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 the head of the household. So there's a lot of, lot of implications that come from there. Uh, some of those policies that Juma and Lula were trying to propose were in a way trying to empower women. And again, Juma sometimes would uh, use um, policies that were quote unquote gender neutral, but he, she would use you know speeches on International Women's Days or, or Mother's Days to emphasize the power and the importance of women on that. Um, so the short answer to your to, to question, of what is the treatment of women? Uh, uh, not great, a lot of violence against women, uh, not that many women in, pol in politics either. You know, the election of, of Juma to, pre to the presidency is, is pretty surprising, even in the context that she was, in a way, appointed by her, her predecessor. Uh, it's still surprising in this context because women have not been a part of the political structure as much. Um, so I'm gonna go back, uh, 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 and, uh, back to quote a question a little bit, but I'm gonna we'll look at some of these questions here. Um, uh, uh, so Jake asked uh, about the, the discussion that the intersection of sexuality and gender in Juma's fall uh, and the concurrent rise of evangelical power and LGBT rights and the masculinization and queering of Juma by her critics. So yeah, Juma has, uh, uh, you know, is, uh, that was another thing, her image is something that was really worked, uh, especially during the first campaign, uh, to create a more affable image. She was a very much a technocrat. Yeah, I know, and I think I mentioned this in the talk, like the way I interpret this is that she has, you know, she was in the guerrilla with a bunch of men and she was a leader in that group, right? So, and she was tortured in prison, right? So she has been in masculine spaces since the very beginning of her political kind of development. Uh, and um, so, so she was very, not, not very feminine in this kind of traditional sense, especially in the Brazilian traditional sense. Right. Um, so during the process, you know, and as, as Jacob is asking me to elaborate, there was a lot of questions about her sexuality. You know, uh, if she, you know, if she was a lesbian or not, as if that matters, right? Uh, um, and and during the, the protests, uh, during the protests, there was a lot of this as well in uh, how they portrayed her. Uh, that was one of the most um, uh, most of the sat satirical uh, comedies in Brazil would use a man to uh, dress as Juma to satirize her, right? So there's a lot of that as well. So there's a lot of this as well in the um, in this, um, she, because she didn't fit the mold, and this goes back to the idea of misogyny, she already didn't fit the mold of, uh, of, of, of the quote unquote, uh, uh, you know, ideal woman in Brazil. And that creates a lot of, uh, a lot of issues there too. Um, so uh, Michaela asked about what are her views on women who are poor? Um, and that was, so to me, that was my, the most interesting, the most surprising uh, uh, kind of a, a finding that we had in our book. 
uh, not necessarily that you know that she didn't. She, so back to your actual question, um, you know, she she was from the Workers' Party, which is a party that you know is very much uh, left leaning, uh, very much uh, uh, um, uh, uh, trying to address uh, issues of poverty. You know, Lula uh, Lula's policy, especially for Dumas as well, lift, lifted uh, over like fifty million people out of poverty in Brazil. Uh, so her policies was, were very much looked uh, targeted at the poor. Um, and her policies were holdovers or like developments or evolutions of Lula's policies, right? So, uh, and, and what happened here for her is that she would use this framing of gender, right? So she would use this intersectional gender lens to send the message, right? So again, the policy itself may not have changed, but she would use a symbolic language that was very much emphasizing poor women and how important it was for, um, for her as a woman and for her as a workers' party president to support women, right? So again, one of the, one of the more interesting findings to, to, to us is that in some of these policies where she was criticized by women, she was mostly criticized by urban middle-class white women who didn't think that she was pr promoting things that were in their view of feminism, right? Uh, and, and again, abortion and reproductive rights are an important part of this, and, and Juma really did not do a lot, and in a way caved in some of those aspects. And that was uh, something that, the, the, again, the white urban women never forgave her for it, and really focused on that as much, a lot. But something that is important, though, abortion is, of course, a problem in rural areas too, but access to anything is a problem in, in rural areas in Brazil. And she, her, this policy is war, yes, uh, emphasized like the, the woman, the mother side a lot of times of the woman, which is something that, again, the, the more like mainstream uh, middle-class white feminist movements didn't like that, right? But in the end, she was really helping those women a lot more than any other president, you know, and any other administration had done before. So, you know, so going back to your question, my assumption is that her views on, on women and poor women was, was especially uh, uh, important for how she saw herself and how she saw her legacy as a president. Um, so, um, so Elliot, I know that some think that the rise of Donald Trump is a reaction of Barack Obama's status as the first black president. Do you think that the rise of Bolsonaro is partially a reaction to Seth's status as the first woman president? That's a good question. Uh, I don't, it's, it's, I, it's bigger than that, right? So in a way, like um, Juma's impeachment was actually uh, Bolsonaro's coming out party, like, you know, as, as a candidate and, a, and with a platform to a certain extent. So he was a federal deputy and on his speech for the impeachment and voting for the impeachment, one, he, uh, he celebrated the torturer, the, the man who tortured Juma Hussef when she was uh, 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 in jail. Right, so the first thing he did was this, like you know, uh, 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 praising the man who tortured her and, and tortured and killed uh, uh, hundreds of people. Uh, but then he actually used what, which would become his slogan later on, which is uh, "Brazil acima de tudo, Deus acima de tudo." So Brazil above all, God, yeah, Brazil above everything, God above all. Right, so, so his her impeachment was um, the. Um, you know, the kind of the fuel that allowed Bolsonaro to gain some kind of more popularity to a certain extent. I wouldn't go as far as saying it was because she was a woman. I think more importantly, it was because of the Workers' Party. So anti-Workers' Party sentiment was especially prevalent in uh, urban areas, in areas that wouldn't have actually voted for the Workers' Party before, but in middle class and, and, and upper class urban areas, there was a very a loathing of the Workers' Party's policies that were redistributive. They were redistributing the money from the rich to the poor uh, that did not bode well with a lot of people. So Bolsonaro was, he, he definitely is a, a reaction of the moment, right? Uh, and locally and globally, right? So this right-wing populism is something that is growing in other places. And I think, um, you know, in 2016, if you had asked most political scientists in Brazil, they would say he had no chance. And I said, November 6, 2016, I said, Bolsonaro is our next president. Uh, and, I, and I think that the reason why there was too many things going on for him not to be. So it wasn't just gender. It was gender and, and, and there's other things that are going on, including the corruption and Bolsonaro, even though he's 
maybe the most corrupt of them all, but he was like Perry corruption. He never really did like grand corruption. He just does like small, not small, but like a, a, a medium sized corruption basically. Um, so yeah, so, so, uh, so he was a reaction all the time. So he was an outsider to a certain extent, even though he was, he has been a deputy for a long time. He was a small deputy. Nobody really kind of know, knew about him. Um, so yeah, so, so, so he was more a reaction at the time. It wasn't to say a gender thing. Of course, that part, of course played part of it, but it wasn't uh, uh, as um, you know as intentional, I guess, or or as uh, um, uh, f uh, oriented by that. So, um, so Colin's question, of course, social movements, Colin. Yes, of course, they're important. Uh, no, just kidding. Uh, oh no, just kidding. No, they are important. Um, what is the role of social movements, feminist demonstration, and demand making in generating women's empowerment in Brazil? Not a war is to what extent Dilma's driving changes herself as opposed to responding to public opinion. On the flip side, has there been an uptick in feminist and pro LGBTQ plus movements challenging the right retrenchment of Tamara Bolsonaro? Um, uh, as always, a complicated question. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do in parts here. So, one, uh, you know, before Bolsonaro was elected, that was what was the largest women-led movement in the history of Brazil, which was the hashtag Ele Não, uh, not him uh, 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 campaign, which started in, so in, in, on Facebook, but it led to like uh, at least 15 uh, 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 protests with millions of women, you know, on the streets uh, saying that, you know, that, that, you know, this is before the election, before Bolsonaro was elected. Uh, and they didn't, that didn't, work in the context that Bolsonaro was elected, but, uh, but it did like again, empower, you know, at least kind of uh, embolden women uh, uh, to be more involved, to run for office. There was a, a higher number of women running for office, but also, as I mentioned, both in the conservative and the, um, uh, and the uh, uh, you know, conservative and liberal sides of it. Uh, there has been a, a discussion. I did not mention this here, but, you know, but two years before, uh, no, the, was, I think it was the year of the election. So early in the year of the election, Bolsonaro was elected in 2018, October. In March, uh, Marielle Franco, who uh, was a city councilwoman in, in Brazil, uh, in, in Rio, um, and, and specifically bumped heads with Bolsonaro and his crew in, in Rio. Uh, so she was, she was black, she was uh, uh, l lesbian, uh, she was from a favela, right? So she, she ticked all the intersectionalities uh, in Brazil to a certain extent, and she was a, a very powerful force, uh, and she was uh, gunned down, she was assassinated uh, in what clearly was a politically mo motivated thing. Uh, it's been over almost a thousand days, and we have not heard, we don't, still do not know who called for her killing, who contracted the killers to kill her. Um, and, you know, and again, there's a lot of indications that not Bolsonaro himself, but a lot of people surrounding him were directly involved in this assassination, her assassination, also emboldened a lot of people, a lot of women, and a lot of uh, people in the LGBTQ community to uh, be more uh, involved, uh, specifically. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, uh, Jacob mentioned in some ways Bolsonaro gained more fame through misogynistic, racist, and homophobic slurs directed at Dilma and her ministers uh, and other PT women. Uh, that, and that, you know, that, that is definitely true that, that uh, um, uh, these uh, events uh, continue and honestly, there's some things that he said that I just want to repeat it. It's just, it's just they're so ridiculous and you know, and no, like even comparing him, like I, it's like he saw Trump and he's like, you know, hold my cerveja, you know, I'm gonna do this worse. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so, so that that was like he was definitely that was part of it. He actually said before, and he continues to say he is he's a prejudiced man with 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 pride. Right, so he's he's homophobic, he's uh, sexist, you know, he's racist, and he's okay with it, basically. Right. Um, um, so Colin again, it was still going. Not as not not as or you know not organized. I think it was in a way like um, those marches that happened here as well, the the march for women in 2017. That you know, at first there's this this collectively collective. Um, goal right there's a for a specific against one thing uh but when people start sitting down and talking about organizing they realize that yeah well again going back to this idea you know middle class white women 
uh, are not going to have the same interests or 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 even the same uh, and and will have different platforms than black women in the favela, the LGBTQ uh, 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 folks, and all that. So you know, it's not not as as big anymore. So. Um, so, uh, Bruce, are women held to a different standard in public perception of dishonest and corruption? Um, this is not from Brazil, but it is from literature uh, uh, from across the world. So, again, first of all, there aren't that many women, as I mentioned before, right? So, these, a lot of times, these analyses are not, uh, uh, they're more qualitative than quantitative. So, we can make some inferences, but it cannot be something generalizable, right? Uh, but it seems like, in general, and especially in Latin America, women, um, women tend to, uh, I think I may have to let my dog in here because it's barking at me. Sorry, just a second. Come here, buddy. You better not bark now. Um, so, um, uh, so, so in general, women tend to be punished, uh, you know, at the polls, uh, uh, you know, at, at the ballot box or in the polls uh, at a much higher rate than uh, than than men. Uh, so when corruption scandals happen and women are involved, or when the economy is is, is going uh, is not doing so well, uh, the public tends to be much more uh, um, um, critical of women than um, um, you know than um, than when they're men. So kind of like the course evaluations uh, that women automatically get being like a point or something. So. Um, so Jacob, uh, it's been my experience that an observation that the assassination had chilling effect in the movement activity. A lot of folks are rightly afraid. Also, thanks for sharing your work. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, yeah, and also, so I, I also interviewed, uh, going back, so, so Jacob does research on LGBTQ rights in Brazil. So that, you know, so he's saying kind of the opposite of what I'm saying here to a certain extent, that there was a lot of people who were intimidated. Um, and so I, I did interview Jean Willis, which who is who was a, a federal deputy, one of the most voted federal deputies uh, uh, in Brazil, from the same party as Marielle, who was assassinated. Uh, so I interviewed him, and about four months later, he he fled the country. So he, you know, he he called a self self exile. Uh, he's I think he's in in Spain now, doing uh, doing work on his PhD, I think. But but he left like he was elected a federal deputy, and he chose not to go because he was scared for his life, right? Um, now, you know, he's also the man who spit, spat on Bolsonaro's face when uh, in Congress, right? So, uh, so that the, the animosity was there for, for longer. Uh, and so that was another reason why he was probably rightly afraid. And by the way, Jean Willis is uh, openly gay. So a big, uh, uh, important force in the LGBTQ community as well. Um, there was discussions earlier about, there was a question earlier about uh, the, the conservative uh, movement, right? Uh, and I think that's part of it too. Like the, uh, Jean Williams, for example, was somebody who was a target of, uh, um, um, and uh, so he's at Harvard now. Uh, okay. Um, so Jean, he, he was a target of a lot of like uh, uh, trolling on the, on the internet, you know? And so again, that's kind of where it came from, I think. Uh, his fears, um, you know, and, and in Brazil, the rise of the evangelical right or the religious right is something that is uh, uh, is even a stronger, a stronger force even that I feel like that we have than we have. There, it's more uh, organized um, even than here, right? And we're seeing, you know, this 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 debate going on here right now with the Supreme Court nomination, um, and I feel like in Brazil there's even more uh, uh, coordination between even among evangelical. Uh, leaders, and you know Jacob was mentioned, especially in Rio. Uh, uh, so yeah, and especially Rio, and especially now because Bolsonaro is from Rio, uh, 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 there's a lot more uh, attention being paid in Rio as well. Okay, should I talk about the qu gender quotas? <laughs> I think that was a question from early on. Um, by the way, so gender quotas uh that was my topic of my dissertation actually right so you know so uh i started researching juma i was in brazil in 2010 uh uh when she was elected and i was doing research on women in the state legislatures right uh and my my dissertation was actually on you know why the gender quota, quotas don't work uh and i have a couple of articles published by that uh, about that um and, and i think go back to i think bruce mentioned earlier um 
the parties are always going to find a way. They're always going to try to find a way to subvert the quota because deep down, most parties, and especially most leaders of parties, don't want to do this, right? In a, in a sense, because this, this ends up being a zero-sum game because to include more women means to remove support or to remove some man from, not from the list necessarily, because the lists are very long uh, uh, of candidates, but remove uh, support for the candidate or just add more like noise or, um, or, 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 or add women who can win. Uh, you know, when I, when I was interviewing women in 2010, the, the woman who was actually the most powerful uh, woman uh, in, uh, in the state of, of, of the federal district, um, she mentioned that she was actually, she was, suppo- she was asked to run uh, uh, because of the quota, but with no support from the party, just say, you know, can you put your name on the quota? Uh, because the way that works in Brazil is the legislative quota, you have to have 30% of, of, of women on the list, right? But because in Brazil, it's an open list PR system. So what that means is that, uh, uh, you know, the parties get a certain amount of seats, uh, uh, depending on how many votes they get. But you're not voting for the party, you're voting for the candidate. So the candidates are based, they're not a list, a rank order list of, of candidates. They, they kind of put themselves there as their rankings. So this woman came in not with no support and she just happened to be very savvy and it was well voted enough to be elected. Uh, and she said that her, uh, she was asked by her brother to run because her brother was the one who wanted to, to be a, a, a state uh, deputy. And her brother lost and never tried politics again. And she has been, she's doing politics. She's one of the, uh, she's not just a federal deputy actually. Um, so, so again, so men see this as a zero sum game. And, and in some contexts, in some contexts it is. However, you know, there's, there's more than, you know, there's, there's, there's more to this discussion of, you know, quotas as being something that is a justice case for quotas, right? So, uh, but, you know, but again, uh, the, 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 the the gist of it is that the quota was the quota actually was written by men in a way uh, trying to um, trying to shut up uh, the women who came from Beijing in 1995 from the women's conference in Beijing that was very important in spreading quota worldwide. You know, before Beijing, there were I think 20 countries who had that had gender quotas uh, in their legislations uh, or even in parties, and now we have over 120 countries who have some form of gender quota there and Beijing was a big part of it. The, women, the, the women, UN Women's Conference in Beijing in 1985 was a major reason for why that happened. Um, so, but in Brazil it was actually written, you know, there was some women involved, but it was written and watered down by men who wrote the law to not work, right? So they wrote a lot with all these loopholes that they, they knew because they wrote it, they knew what the loopholes were. Uh, so that was 1995. So um, 2000, 19, no, 2009, they, they did some reforms to try to fix that in, in a way also to, to allow, to give women more power. And then in 2017, they went one step further with the law and also required parties to uh, allocate funds for women candidates, right? So, so this, I'm just gonna say this real quick and I hopefully have more questions. So what happened in 2017 was this, they, they passed this law, uh, you know, they changed the law to say women, ha- we have to allocate 30% of funds from the party for women candidates, right? But the language of the law didn't specify which women, right? So I think there was an assumption that the, the money would go to women who were running for the positions where there is a quota, right? For the legislative positions, right? But what happened was this, this was an unprecedented number. I can't remember the numbers now, but we had almost no, no women running for vice governors uh, and this, and in 2018, we had eight women out of 27 states. So over 30% of, uh, of the women, of the, of the, of the candidates running for, for governor had a vice governor, a woman. And the idea was that now they could use the funds to that position. So basically they're, they're using the funds to support the election of a male governor and not of a female deputy, right? So that was the, the, the last time, the last attempt of trying to, uh, 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 skirt the law, basically. You know, the paper that we wrote, me and my co-author, uh, Christian Wiley, wrote on, on, on this was a, a law on paper only, right? Because that was kind of the idea is that, you know, this law is on paper. In Brazil, they say a lei que não pega, a law that doesn't stick, right? So we have a law on paper. It's a formal law, right? Uh, uh, but, but the parties were not really uh, in, interested in enforcing it because they wrote the law with the intent of, of breaking it. 
So I think we have time for another question or two, if Pedro is willing. Yep. I wonder if you could maybe uh, speak to, uh, so those of us who don't follow Brazilian politics the way you do, um, uh, point of reference is likely to be U.S. politics. And I'm wondering if you could speak maybe to any parallels you might see between the <coughs> uh, corrosive public treatment of a figure like Dilma in Brazil and the treatment of Hillary Clinton over a, probably a longer period. Um, now I'll go further uh, to, to make things even. Uh, Sarah Palin. You know, oh, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and now we're actually seeing this with uh, Amy Barrett as well. Of course, yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, so, so that's not, <laughs> that's where misogyny doesn't have party, right? right. No, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, so the, 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 and, and it, again, it is so normalized that only when it's on the other side that we see it, right, in general, right? right? Uh, uh, we don't think much if we're doing ourselves, like collectively, not individually, but if right. collectively people are making a joke about, this woman, we don't address it if it's not, you know, on our political, you know, ideology. Um, but, you know, but yeah, so I, and I think there's a lot of parallels between, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jumo Hosef especially and, uh, and uh, um, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, both competent and smart women who are uh, um, constantly demeaned and, under, and, uh, and, and hurt their intelligence undermined and their capacity of leading undermined even though they have been leading for decades, literally, right? Um, so there's definitely a parallel there. Um, and yeah, and, you know, and, and also in a way, again, Brazil has a different system in the sense that, um, you know, we have an a, a extreme multi-party system. We have over 30 parties in Brazil. But for presidents, for, presidents, if for, for a long time, it was only two, three parties that were, that were kind of vying for the presidency. Um, and in the last few years, there has been a, a strong polarization to, of, you know, of, you know, of, you know, kind of a progressive left wing, you know, and conservative specifically, especially religious conservative, uh, evangelical conservatives in Brazil. Um, so that's also, there's another parallel, I think, between Brazil and the United States. Uh, you know, and again, we're both, we're both white supremacist states uh, built on slavery, built on the backs right. of people that have not ever reaped the benefits of what they built. Uh, and that matters, so, you know, built on violence, right, you know, as well. Uh, and that matters, I think, too, in terms of, like, why violence against women is so normalized as well, and why it is so um, commonplace, and, and, and a lot of times just skirted as, oh, that's just, that's just politics, right? So why, if you don't want to do this, don't, 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 go into, don't go into politics type of thing. We, there's a lot of that, that that is heard. I think we hear this both here and in Brazil. Uh, Megan asked if there are quotas in other institutions like schools. So yes, uh, there is a racial quota uh, in uh, 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 higher education in Brazil. So higher education in Brazil, uh, public institutions are the are, are better than, than private, and they're completely free, right? So if you get into a public institution, it, it is it is completely free, right? Uh, so what happened with those is that only the, the wealthy are able to. There's an entry exam, right? To get into those, and those entry exams are very competitive. Right? I think uh, the one that I got closest to get in, getting in, uh, I was placed. Um, there was 70, 70 places in this. Uh, uh, I was for a law law school. There were seventy places. I got placed in one hundred and tenth, uh, and there were twenty two hundred people vying for seventy places in this public university. Right. So, so a lot of my friends uh, uh, who had the means would. Um, would uh, spend one or two years studying uh, after finishing grad, grad, uh, high school to get into these this institutions. Uh, so what the, the quotas have done, the quotas are both for race and for, um, and for a class as well, right? So there's a, a class, uh, kind of an income level quota as well. And the race one is of course controversial. Um, uh, and in a way the race one, I, I mentioned this in a few places, the, the race one was, was actually designed to empower Afro-Brazilians, right? In a way to, 
to in a way force people to identify as black or brown, right? Uh, so they can actually feel, uh, you know, not just pride, but feel just feel an identity with that, an affinity. Because in Brazil, race is much more complicated than it is here. I think you mentioned that in the beginning, right? Uh, um, yeah, so yeah, so that, that was like the, the quotas. It is still very controversial. They don't, they they don't, they happen in uh, the uh, the places. You know, Jacob is saying that some universities have trans quotas too. I did not know that. That's that's pretty awesome. Um, you know, and then the follow up, are there gender disparities in other sectors, education, business, etc. Just like here, uh, we're getting to a point that there are more women graduating from college than men, right? So we do have, uh, um, so I, you know, I, this, I'll have to look at the numbers, but I, I would guess that the, the gender disparities in Brazil are similar to the ones in the United States, specifically for middle-class urban uh, white women, right? Uh, when we get to the gender disparities in race and class base and regional regional base in Brazil, then things get a little more complicated, right? You know, and, and then the, the disparity between uh, men and women is much higher. Uh, but but intersectionally speaking, you know, the 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 difference between a black man and a black woman is not that high, right? But the, the difference between a black there, there's a, a bigger difference between a, a black woman and a white woman than there will be between a black woman and a black man, right? Uh, so the disparities are. Uh, uh, I would. I would. I would. Argue, I would guess slash argue that uh, similar to here, it is in in this more uh, um, you know this white supremacist sense, in this universalizing in the, the white experience sense. Uh, but when you start breaking down by region, by sexual identity, right, by 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 race and all those things, then things get a little more complicated. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Pedro. Um, it's We're approaching nine o'clock and I want to make sure people are able to get their kids off to bed or whatever we need to do. I know you've got a dog somewhere in the room with you. Um, <laughs> once you nice. That's good. <clears throat> and mine's been banned from this section of the house because he also is a barker. Um, and uh, uh, on behalf of the Latino Latin American Studies Program, I want to thank Dr. DuSantos for sharing his work with us tonight. Um, this is a, a fantastic, really interesting conversation. Um, <clears throat> uh, we hope that everyone will be able to join us again on November 4th, also Wednesday uh, evening, when Dr. Anita Carrasco will speak with us about um, uh, culture as resistance in the Chilean Andes and indigenous communities struggle for rights and recognition in the face of mining. Uh, thank you all for coming and have a, have a wonderful evening. Yep, thank you all. And again, I, I, I'm imagining you all clapping, stay innovation right now actually, because you're getting up to do something. So. The crowd is going wild. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pedro. Thank